2020. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I hate it. From those of you watching from a different time period in the hopefully distant future, I hope the distant future exists as a concept. Perhaps you found this video on a floppy disk in an abandoned warehouse <laughs> from a civilization past. Well, hi, my name is Lena Norms. If subscribing is still a thing, I encourage you to subscribe. <laughs> wow, she's whoring herself out even in the afterlife. I'm speaking to you from the year of our Lord 2020 and it's been a weird one. And not weird in a kind of dog in a pumpkin soup way, not weird in a high society, mad hatter, rocky horror picture show kind of way, in a really quite profoundly scary way. And I'm just not up for Halloween this year. <laughs> I think I think we could skip a year. I'm a child that wasn't that accustomed to Halloween as it is. Growing up in a Christian community, uh, nobody celebrated Halloween. And even though now I remain an agnostic adult, I am still really afraid of the dark. <laughs> like in a kind of embarrassing way. You know, The Secret Window? Yeah, the, sec the, the Johnny Depp film, Secret Window. I had to walk out of the cinema halfway through. I was not having any of it. <laughs> Once me and my friend Sana went on a tour of the London vaults and I had to be taken out halfway through, through a fire exit and left in the reception sitting on a plastic chair thinking, actually, you know, I wasn't even that embarrassed. I'm like, why would we go down there? It's clearly haunted. <laughs> there is nothing about the cottage core, pumpkin soaked, toffee apple life that can coat Halloween for me in a more appealing way. I just believe in ghosts, guys, and I don't think they're all good. Even if you usually really enjoy Halloween, perhaps this year it's not the year for you. <laughs> so I thought we could curl up and have a chat about some of my soothing recommendations uh, for books this year. I was originally gonna call this video books on my nightstand, but um, I don't have a nightstand because I'm a millennial in London. This is, this, this is my room, It's the, this is my wingspan and this is the width of my room. They are very similar. But I do have a mouldy windowsill. So let's give you a little tour, shall we? Water for hydration. Enjoy the clean water while it's here. This is my literal favourite reading light. I was like getting into really like reading my Kindle at night so that I wouldn't keep my boyfriend up, Craig because it had like a backlight. This is RIP before I broke it, by the way. <laughs> Even though it's not an LED screen, it was definitely like keeping me awake and it was stopping me from getting through all my physical books. So when my Kindle died, RIP, please don't haunt me. Um, I got this and it has like two lights on it. You put it around your neck and then you can lie in bed and read like this. And if somebody's sleeping next to you, they can't see the light, but your book is perfectly illuminated and you can get through all your physical books while the anxiety insomnia hits. So, would recommend. <laughs> Not spawn. <laughs> it's even rechargeable, so I think to call it a sustainable object would be a massive stretch, but there's that. Mouth guard, so I don't wake said boyfriend up. Craig is a light sleeper, and I guzzle like a whale in my sleep, so I literally have to clamp my jaw shut at an angle so the air can still pass out like this. I'm not far asleep. <laughs> Okay. I will do anything for love. Even that. And then these are my books. <laughs> Come a bit closer and we'll take a look. So I've done a lot of foolish things in the past, many of which aren't the subject of this video, but one of them was I treated my reading time in the evenings like any other time of day. I took the book to bed that I was currently reading and I would continue reading it like time was immaterial. Ah. To be young and foolish, again, I wouldn't for the world. I've very much started recently treating my bedtime reading as a different beast entirely. Not only if you read the wrong book before bedtime, you get bad dreams or you don't sleep as deeply or you get kept awake by the science of existential dread. I also don't think you're really serving those books properly. There are some non-fiction books that I, I know that I have dragged my eyes down every single page of that book. So it is on my red list on Goodreads, but was I truly present during those pages? No. And while it is like, you know, encouraged to utilize every single minute of the day, bedtime reading can be incredibly useful and replenishing and wholesome, but it can't be productive in the way that other slots that you might have available for reading could be. 
and I've come to accept that as an elderly woman wrapped in her duvet. I'm just not gonna be able to take in the inhabitable earth and really act on it while my brain is in defrag and shut down mode. But there are lots of types of books that I keep by my bedside, some of them for months, even years, that never fail me, that have actually never made it to my red list because I've never finished them, but almost have a hypnotic quality to them. They kind of just drop my head down almost instantly. And not because they're boring. Um, after a kind of chapter or something, I feel comforted, I feel inspired, and I feel ready to shut the world out. So here are some of my recommendations, but they're not only recommendations, I'm also gonna talk about why I think they work. So there might be stuff on your bookshelves that you already have that might be able to serve this purpose. But also obviously it is also, as always, an excuse to talk about some amazing books that I love. So the first book and also type of book that I like to keep on my bed are essay collections. It's quite hard actually to find uplifting, comforting, not too heavy, he heavy, heavy, <laughs> heavy, but also chic, heavy essay collections, um, just because of the kind of topics that they cover. It's called Stop What You're Doing and Read This. This one is about some of the things that stop us from reading books and a little bit about funding and how sad it is that libraries are closing, but mostly 10 essays all about the importance of stories and reading and how they've made amazing uplifting changes in the essayist's worldview and, and what's been transformative. And it's very uplifting. It's got Mark Haddon, Michael Rosen, Zadie Smith, Jeanette Winterson, Tim Parks, you get the idea. Essay collections in general are great because you can have that sense of completion and like, yes, I can go to sleep now, I have completed something by only reading, you know, five to eight pages worth of text. And because there's not this huge momentum with them, you can just like, if you can't sleep, turn the light on, pick up one, and not feel like you're being carried by a momentum to keep reading, because the idea is that eventually you do go back to sleep. This is one of my favourites, but any essay collection that you like and makes you feel inspired will do. This is a weird one, and I've never actually finished it. I'm getting, I'm, I'm really making headway though, considering I've owned it for eight years. It's called Luella's Guide to English Style. If you like the kind of style of writing that maybe uh, Pandora Sykes does about fashion, or like kind of, you know, that Sunday Times columnist kind of witty, pithy, but really decorative, uh, writing about fashion and looks and what that says about attitudes in society, a, l a little, a pinch of that social commentary, um, then you'll really like this. It's, it's, it is quite dated, like there are some like references or, or like words that I'm a bit like, mm, it wouldn't fly now. It goes through kind of English style icons and talks about like why their looks are so iconic. <laughs> It is to some extent diverse. It definitely could be more diverse, but it does have people like Polly Styrene in, who's very cool. And it's not just kind of people in the fashion eye that are in here. It's like, she's got Agatha Christie in here. <laughs> it's very incredibly tongue in cheek. If you're not British, the humor is very dry, um, but it's some, it, that's why it sends me to sleep. It has this kind of very comforting, you know, low stakes, kind of discussions about different ways to wear jeans through the ages, what that might say about society. It's very self-critiquing about the kind of irony of trying to be English in any way, because it's just not really, I don't know, leave your thoughts on the thing in the comments below, but I feel like the English have stolen, overpowered so many other kind of cultures that Englishness is really quite empty for me as a concept. So to have some kind of reflection on that as well was quite good, but she's still also kind of a columnist. So she's not really that kind to anyone, even though there's underlying thing of affection. She talks about all the different kind of like groups of people, ska, goths, glam rock, grunge, post-punk, whatever the hell that is. And it's got colour plates so you can have a little look at some pictures before bed, which is nice as well. I think it's also interesting because I've been thinking recently about how I, like this channel kind of used to be a clothes and makeup channel. And I do still really love the artistry of that a little bit. And I'm always kind of drawn to things that inspect that even though it's not like the focus of my life I still find so much joy in the kind of artistry of styling I don't know I don't know I feel good about it you can't go wrong with a good children's book and this is really my only exception to my no scary books before bed rule and that is my new <laughs> very recent discovery of the series of unfortunate events books <laughs> I don't really have a reason why I didn't read them as a child I just I do remember them being in my library but they'd all, all only ever be like 
book five book eight and book 13 in stock like there never was number one so i just never started reading them these ones are craig's he has like in gel pen his own name that he wrote in them when he was like eight <laughs> they're surprisingly comforting to read i don't know if i just like reading about heirs to big inheritances being chased down by struggling actors because at heart i'm a socialist but there is also something weirdly comforting about reading low stakes peril um, in a funny, jovial kind of way, like Limony Snicket or Daniel Handler. Right, so I'm on book eight right now, and to use a phrase like I'm trying to sound like I am from the internet, it gives me life. They give me life. Even if you don't usually read children's books, consider picking up a chart. Get back here. Picking up a children's book and leaving it by your bed. I don't think, I don't think you'd be sad about it. Middle grade is the best, I think, because it still engages your brain, but nothing like ever that bad happens in it. Roald Dahl would work for this too, I guess. Choose your poetry carefully, I'd say, before bed. You can't go wrong with a bit of Maya Angelou. Uh, this is called Celebrations, Rituals of Peace and Prayer. It's really short. All the text is really well spaced out. And even when you just open it like this, you'll find something hopeful and really insightful on every page. And if you are somebody that prays as well, there is like kind of prayer stuff and vigil stuff in here as well. Um, but even just like, I've just opened it on a random page and it says, continue to remind people that each is as good as the other and that no one is beneath nor above you. Continue to remember your own young years and look with favor upon the lost and the least and the lonely. Stunningly beautiful, really rhythmic reflections on how cruel but how beautiful the world can be and it's kind of like somebody incredibly wise sitting by your bedside and giving you like a short sermon and i really really like it consider self-help books um this is oliver berkman help exclamation mark i think these were originally a column a very long time ago and he's somebody that i hadn't heard of before but as soon as i got this a, a while ago i was sitting on the tube and a woman leaned over to me and was like I love that book. And like, I've taken it a few places of a pin like, oh my God, are you reading Help? And I didn't realize it has like a bit of a cult following. It's kind of like a sensible self-help for people who are deeply skeptical and lean towards the pessimistic. How to become slightly happier and get a bit more done. So if you are like in bed and you're actually really worrying about something to do with family or work, you can kind of like usually find something in here quite easily that relates vaguely to what you're going through and soothes you a little bit. It's like, it's not the biggest thing in the world. There is a solution and you won't remember this in five years kind of thing. Um, there was one that I really liked about him saying that, you know, somebody had written in being like, I don't have any friends. Why do all of my friends have friends and I don't really have that many friends? And he was like, this is a maths problem. <laughs> people who have friends know lots of people. People who don't have many friends have no, no fewer people. So it's more likely if you have fewer friends that the friends that you do have are the kinds of people that have loads of friends. You won't know many people by pure maths that don't have many friends because they don't have many friends. <laughs> this is a connection web issue. It doesn't mean you're actually in a minority. And I was like, he's a very wise man. You should definitely listen to Oliver. I really like a, a good translation before bed. I find that either like the kind of essence of the story is, is more clear. So I find it easily, easier to read before bed, mainly because I guess it's gone through a translator. So sometimes I find that they're better edited and, and more concise because I guess there's been a conversation or, or, or a feeling of a conversation between the translator and the author that's really got to the essence of a story. I don't know if that makes any sense or if that's true, but that's just my sense of it. I always find translated books to be really clever in their simplicity. And maybe that's just because when you read a translated book, it's the best from that country because usually it's the best books that rise up to be translated, I guess. But this is The Housekeeper and the Professor by Yoko Ogawa. And if you like the elegance of the hedgehog and you like small stories about inter-age, platonic relationships, you know what I'm talking about? Is there, is there a better word for that genre? This is about an elderly professor who has a memory that only lasts a couple of hours. Every housekeeper has found him impossible to look after and has quit. And then there's this housekeeper that comes who decides to embrace him as he is. And he kind of walks around with loads of p bits of paper pegged to him with bulldog clips so he can remind himself of what's going on and where he is. Uh, and it's about her and him forming a friendship and also her son who comes to hang around the house like after school and becomes enthralled by the professor's knowledge of maths. And it's all about the beauty of maths. If you're somebody who loves maths, 
it's also basically a love story to maths. But um, this is one of the best books I've read all year, so I'm probably gonna talk about this in my 2020 wrap up more, but it's incredibly comforting. It's so well written that you always know what's going on, even if you are a little bit asleep. It's set in Japan, it's incredibly atmospheric, and I couldn't recommend it more, especially before bed. This one I have to be a little bit biased about because this is by my friend Jen, the bookshop book by Jen Campbell, but it's a collection of factoids and mini atmospheric essays about over three 300 I think, did I get that right? 300 bookshops all over the world and lots of them in really unusual locations and with unusual stories behind them. So uh, bookshops in barns, disused factories, converted churches, underground car parks, bookshops on boats, on buses and in old rundown railways. If you feel like dipping in or perhaps completely dunking your head uh, into a book, this one is perfect for that. If you're somebody who likes the atmosphere and the idea of being in a bookshop very comforting, then this is guaranteed to soothe your soul a little bit and send you to sleep. This is an example of a more moving poetry collection if you're in, in the mood for that to really listen. I think there's like something, there's this kind of stillness in listening, I guess. And I think this is something that's really immersive and so wonderfully written that you will forget what's going on in your own life. This is Singing My Mother's Song by Rebecca Tantoni. It's a poetry collection about her reconnection and her investigation into the history of her uh, South African family and how it helps her learn about herself. Um, she says, I believe through blood and blow bone, nurture and habit, we carry in our bodies those who came before us. Sometimes we are conscious of this. We see patterns or behaviours replicated, the same mistakes made, the same choices determine why what has come to pass. In other times it isn't transparent, but we are drawn somehow. As if we're anchored by a perspective that doesn't belong to us, or at least we no longer need to claim it as our own personal truth. So she goes to... Cape Town, Port Elizabeth, Queenstown, Johannesburg, and then finally back to Bristol. It has loads of color illustrations in it as well, which are absolutely incredible. And it's just kind of poetry that will take you out of yourself and make you also kind of think about how ancient the world is and how much history there is beyond our own lives. And I think it's just like a really, I, I think, I guess it's just a really grounding poetry collection. I think that's what I can muster to say about it, but it's just, it's just really incredible. This is a backwards book recommendation because I kind of recommend this book and I really fucking don't. <laughs> um, it's called Daily Rituals by Mason Curry. Uh, it's literally a book about the daily rituals of famous people's lives in history. It's kind of illuminating in that I found out the incredibly important fact that Patricia Highsmith, who wrote The Talented Mr. Ripley, uh, was really into snails and wasn't allowed to bring them to France on holiday with her, so she used to smuggle them under her boobs in her... <laughs> bra and also used to take them in her handbag to all her book launches some people's days are incredibly boring and that has actually really hit the spot for me when i'm trying to go to sleep by reading somebody else's timetable of what they do it's also very illuminating because you realize a lot of the most brilliant people in history had maids and wives and people who made them meals <laughs> and that's why they got to make their work uninterrupted you'll probably find this book more interesting if you have like better general knowledge than me because i genuinely don't know who a lot of the people in this book are but i guess the lesson from this book is don't throw away the books that you find inherently boring give them a whirl on your nightstand before you throw them away because they might have secret powers you're not yet utilizing and I, I've never finished this book, and I honestly don't think I ever will. If that's not sustainable, I don't know what is. I've talked about this book before, but it probably serves the same purpose in a different way to help, in that it is called The Poetry Pharmacy Returns, and you can look up your conundrum in the index, and it will give you a poem that fits with that conundrum. They can be really general, but they also can be wonderfully specific. Uh, so there's sections like Silver Linings, half and home, hesitation and choice, but within that, overthinking, unrealized talents, romantic dilemmas, fear of loss, unkindness to oneself, constant striving, pushy parenting, people pleasing, political apathy, feeling isolated, stuff like that. There are two, I have both, uh, but I found that the Poetry Pharmacy Returns just had poems I preferred in it for some reason. So I am picked up this one, but they're both really good. And there is nothing like a personally prescribed poem to tell you it's all gonna be okay. And then finally, this is a book that I hauled in the summer, you might remember it. Imagine a Country, Ideas for a Better Future. This is a huge, a huge compendium of 
they're not even really essays they're more like thoughts two pages like literally nobody had more than 500 words i think from exclusively scottish voices about ways scotland could be better as somebody who isn't scottish but has a lot of scottish family and has spent a lot of time in scotland this was really lovely to read i hope that you get this country people because it sounds great i think because they've they've thrown the net so wide it is a bit hit and miss but i came away with some really happy hopeful ideas from this and it was definitely something really nice to read before bed just to read that people had hope about the future little and big ways to make the world better and i like the fact that even though it's got people like ali smith in it um alexander mccall smith ian rankin carol ann duffy it also has people who are currently experiencing homelessness in it they've done a great job of including non-white scottish journalists in it as well which i think was really good and i also really valued the different ways that people presented stuff some artists just drew stuff in it there is a composition in here just some sheet music of a, of a song that somebody wrote about what they'd like scotland to be like in the future and there were just there were obviously some big ideas about climate change and reducing co2 emissions and rewilding reclaiming the land from from english landowners which uh, i fully support but there's also really small ideas like something that really took me uh, aback and and took me by surprise uh, was that i just kind of started spontaneously crying when i read this uh, really small thought that was, was somebody was just like i've noticed that the train i think it was from edinburgh to glasgow is only 50p more for a return and sometimes i'll always buy a return just even if i'm not thinking of returning to edinburgh and i only need a single because i just think it's only 50p so he was like what if we put a box on the platform at both ends where people could put in their return tickets so that other people could take spontaneous trips or trips that they needed to for free uh, to the other city and or even maybe just have an afternoon on a train because they need it and what if we also didn't just have quiet carriages on trains but we also in, in introduced the idea of a chatty carriage where you could get on a train for free and go to the chatty i'm not crying i'm just thinking about it i don't know why <laughs> like a chatty carriage where if you're lonely you can just get on a train and go to the chatty carriage and not feel ashamed for wanting to talk to people and <laughs> i don't know why that makes me want to cry it's probably indicative of this year that that makes me cry but i just i i just think that it shows you that the small ideas are probably as important as the big ones when it comes to insisting on hope um so i really i just think this is a perfect one for your bedside even if you're not scottish even if you're you kind of struggle to care about your country or do really care about your country and want it to be better they're really short sharp injections of hope Thank you so much for watching. What are you doing this weird Halloween year? Are you doing anything? I also want to hear your books that you keep on your nightstand or books that just comfort you because I would love that during this unprecedented reading year. By the way, I hit my reading goal of 100 books this year, but I feel nothing. Thank you so much for watching. These videos are free to watch, but if you would like to be one of the lovely people that contributes to making them possible, you can look into joining the Gumption Club. One of the coziest, kindest, uh, little online communities that we have in this bleak world. If you sign up on Patreon, you will then be included in the secret Facebook group, should you wish, where we share all of the feelings and all of the book recommendations all of the time. And we're also gonna be doing some more wholesome watch alongs where we just watch wholesome films together remotely, because we're cool. I hope you're being nice to yourself and keeping cozy wherever you are. Frog snug out. <laughs>